about that afterwards. So without further ado, I'll ask Rick Knowlton to come to the and share thoughts about mouth guards with us today. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. The um, it's always it's always enjoyable being the first speaker after lunch. So um, I'll try to be brief. And if you guys start to fade, I'll increase the volume a little bit. There's no uh, no water up here to throw at you, but that's okay. So in either case, I'd like to say that that it's an honor and a privilege today to be part of such a world-renowned group of clinicians and part of such an outstanding symposium on treating and most importantly reducing oral facial trauma in athletes. Now basically my goal or my goal today is to really talk to you about mouth guards. And unfortunately, you know, mouth guards are especially in the US and I, it seems like from my esteemed colleague earlier that mouth guards are, are very much an important part of, of you know, an athlete. But it's more than just putting in a piece of rubber in between the tooth or in between the teeth. As you see in this, in this boxer here that we're using as, as our major marketing piece, this boxer doesn't have a mouth guard. He has, you know, he supposedly should have a mouth guard. But he basically has his exposed central incisors there to it. And that's really what happens with a lot of our athletes. A lot of our athletes are only required to put something in their mouth. But something in their mouth does very little to really protect the athlete from oral facial trauma. And what our goal today is really to educate you as far as there is a difference in mouth guards. There's a lot of junk out there. There's a lot that that do very little other than the psychological effect that I'm protected because I'm wearing something. And I hope today, after this short presentation, to give you an idea on what we can do, that there are quality opportunities for us to, uh, to be able to provide that. The, it's the, um, so a little bit of history, though, of the mouth guard and, and of boxing, since we're, this is a boxing symposium. The first sport to be filmed was boxing in 1894. And Thomas Edison ended up uh, filming an exhibition match between heavyweight champion James Corbett and the last amateur bo or local amateur boxer Peter Courtney. Since the day, more films have been filmed about boxing than any other sport. The reason it's easier to film two people than it is many others on a, on a playing field. The first mouth guard was, was established by George Wright. He was basically a hitter in the National League for the Red Stockings in 1876. And he was the first entrepreneur to start pushing mouth guards. The first known custom mouth guard was made by, in 1892 by Dr. Wolf Krauss for his son Philip. And Philip later constructed uh, a guard for British boxer Ted the Kid Lewis. He wore a rim of gutta percha over his upper front teeth, much like a type 1 mouth guard. And in 1921, that mouth guard was declared illegal by, by the Boxing Commission. There's a picture of Ted the Kid Lewis and Jack Britton. Um, the, uh, the ruling was, was that Lewis could no longer compete because of that mouth guard. And in 1927, Jack Sharkey and, and Mike Mateague Basically, Mateague was way ahead in the bout and was cut by his teeth with a punch and couldn't continue. And then shortly after, boxing officials allowed the use of mouth guards. In 1930, the first article on mouth guards appeared in the dental literature. The functions of a mouth guard hold the soft tissue of the lips away from the teeth and help to prevent lacerations. They also help to protect the teeth from direct blows that distribute the forces that could displace or fracture the anterior teeth. This isn't a uh, boxer. This is a, a patient of mine 
the actually a basketball player went up for a rebound and ended up uh, fra he ended up having a lateral luxation of the two front teeth with a fracture of the buccal plate of bone. So it can happen in any sport. Obviously, he wasn't wearing a mouth guard, but he did after that. Mouth guards will help to prevent also teeth in the opposing arches from a violent contact that could potentially chip or fracture them. A properly fitted mouth guard, we're going too fast here, or I'm talking too slow, one or the other. They want to get me off in 30 minutes, so, so um, the, uh, basically what it does is it helps to support the mandible by absorbing forces, and it's been theorized that mouth guards could minimize a potential concussion by preventing the upward and backward displacement of the condyles against the temporal bone. However, currently there isn't sufficient clinical evidence to support this, but there is some belief that in a particular blow to the jaw that it might make a difference. So what are the types of mouth guards? Basically there's the type 1, which is a stock mouth guard. The type 2 is a boil and bite, which is formed in the mouth. A type 3 is a custom one, and, which is vacuum formed or pressure laminated. These simple, this is a simple one of basically a, a stock one. It's a latex rubber mouthpiece. The protection is very uncomfortable and really can actually limit mandibular movement, speaking, and breathing. There's a, this uh, example of a stock bimaxillary mouth guard. It basically doesn't offer any kind of protection of what it's supposed to do. It, it, for us, basically, I cringe when I see athletes trying to wear these things. All it really does is protect you know, from orthodontic appliances with cuts, cuts of lips. So the boil and bite is the most common in the U.S. 90 to 95% of all mouth guards worn are boil and bite types. And they're shaped by heating in a boiling water cooling down very quickly and ultimately then placing them in the mouth. The problem is they, the, uh, because of the, the limitations on there, it often causes distortion with body temperatures. So there are many choices today out there. You can go to a sporting goods store in the U U.S. and there's hundreds of them. But it's really not about the color, it's about the fit. There's, there's, there's all kinds, there's straps, there's no straps, there's basically high end and low end. There's, there's bimaxillary, which is, you know, shown on the bottom left hand corner. The, uh, the boil and bite mouth guards can be purchased in the U.S. anywhere from a one, one dollar to about thirty dollars. And unfortunately, what happens when you stick it in the water and it starts to heat up, it decreases decreases the occlusal thickness during forming anywhere from 70 to 99 percent. When I, we do American football and I see, I walk on the field after a football game and I love to see all the mouth guards, the boil and bite mouth guards that are laying on the field because they got knocked out and the athlete didn't want to pick it up and kick the mud or dirt off of it. So they just kind of left it lay there. The, um, this is an example of a, a bimaxillary mouth, form, mouth guard. It's designed to stabilize the lower jaw and is thought to be somewhat protective of, of the TMJ. But again, when you have this boil and bite that's very loose in the mouth, it really impacts as far as difficulty breathing and, as well as speaking. You know, the, in, in, there's a lot of different boxing mouth guards that are, that are you know, promoted in the U.S. You know, Everlast has a bimaxillary one. You know, there's the brain pad, which was originally marketed for to minimize the risk of concussion. They kind of got on that, even though it was not substantiated. And tap out basically has a, a basically a boil and bite mouth guard that ultimately has a little piece of rubber that comes down to protect the lower teeth. So the custom vacuum formed is the one that's most widely used in the dental profession. It offers good protection for the athletes with the least amount of interference. And at the very least, I would encourage you to start to look at basically a custom vacuum formed on there, though I think there's better out there. 
So it's fabricated from a single sheet of EVA material. That EVA material is heated, placed over a stone model, and suctioned down by vacuum to fit the shape of the mouth and of the teeth. Unfortunately, because of this one single sheet, you're limited as far as the size of it. Uh, and you only have one shot to get it down. The uh, NAPIC in 2007 found at EVA that there was less tooth deflection, a greater cushioning effect, and fewer fractured teeth than the boil and bite mouth guards composed of a similar material. This delimitates the difference between vacuum formed and, and heat pressure laminated. Both can produce excellent results. The heat pressure laminate is a type produced by the most commercial labs that are out there advertising mouth guard fabrication. The main difference between the vacuum formed and the pressure laminate is the laminate is made by using multiple sheets laminated upon one another and cast onto the athlete's teeth with the use of a special machine. The advantages of this type of mouth guard is basically the intimacy of the fit, the custom design capability, the dimensional stability, and a better balanced occlusion. This shows a typical vacuum forming machine. The heating element is at the top. The, the EVA material is placed on the, in the clamp. It's heated up by the heating element. It starts to drop onto the model. The model is put on the stage, starts to drop onto the model. And when it gets to a, a certain temperature, the, the clamp is released and, and the stage is brought down onto the model with the vacuum turned on. These are some of the sheets. Typically, the vacuum formed are more square in nature, and they can be anywhere from one to six millimeters in thickness and run about a dollar to five dollars a sheet. The key, the key with any kind of mouth guard fabrication is establishing full buckle extensions for the mouth guard. So it not only, not only protects the, the hard tissue, the teeth themselves, but also protects some of the soft tissue as well. The properly trimmed one basically makes a huge difference as far as having a tapered sides and when you go to do vacuum forming. Most common type of lubricant that is used to release the mouth guard is the silicone type. The model should be free of bubbles and clean, and then lubricated prior to placing the EVA material over top. You want to trim the pallet, or in such cases, have a hole placed in the model. Um, increasing the vacuum, the vacuum is key to having, a, having the mouth guard adapt to the model. Oftentimes, a hole is placed in there to try to get more vacuum to suck the, the EVA material onto the model to get a better fit. Or a lot of times, they'll remove the pallet area so that you get more vacuum, which pulls the material down. Mouth guard materials for vacuum form come in a variety of colors and thicknesses, usually 2 to 4 millimeters. The unfortunate thing is, though, when vacuum forming, it's been found to de decrease the thickness of the material occlusally by a, a good 25%, and on the buccal lingual surfaces, up to 50% or more, simply because as that material is, is heated and softening, that vacuum is pulling that material down. So you're, the problem is you're still way, way ahead of the boil and bites, but the problem is you still are decreasing the occlusal and the incisal edge thickness with it. The other real problem, though, is that they don't, uh, they don't retain their, their protection. They basically, because of heating, it's only good for a few weeks after wearing, and then they start to spring out. This is a typical sl slide of a boil and bite, or not a boil and bite, a vacuum formed. One sheet with the, uh, and this one happened to have, have the logo in it. The, the type three, which is the pressure laminate, is the one I'm going to spend the majority of my time on because I, it's my feeling that that is the mouth guard that we should be placing in all of our athletes, especially the, our elite athletes who really, really need the best protection possible. The uh, basically, 
The pressure laminated has multiple sheets that you can laminate together. It'll, it has basically a maximum pressure of about six atmospheres on some of the machines. They can be fused together and they can be made adequately thick and protective uh, in a variety, for any particular type of athlete or athletic sport that's out there. It's a typical one of a pressure laminated, has good, ad good adaptation, really covers co well up into the buckle fold. The, uh, the advantages of a pressure laminated mouth guard is it's going to remain in place far better during sports activities. It allows for more balanced occlusion, which is really very, very important in supporting the mandible. And there, the most importantly as well is the negligible deformation when worn for prolonged periods of time. No elastic memory, there's no elastic memory when high heat is combined with high pressure during fabrication. So if you want something for a longer period of time, longer season, the pressure laminate is going to be far, far superior to anything else out there. You can, as I said earlier, you can thicken the area by laminating different pieces together. We can customize it with the name, the sport, the age, the level of competition. Any missing teeth can be blocked out. It gives a much, much better ability. And most importantly, we want to have a balanced occlusion and, ba and a separation to reduce trauma to the temporomandibular joint. It allows, by staying up better, it allows more for more effective communication. Athletes can talk very, very clearly with it. Breathing is minimized with the pressure laminating. There's less wear with chewing and biting because it's staying up, so the athlete doesn't have to constantly be chewing to try to keep it in place. And they're more comfortable to wear. The machines, basically, the pressure laminated machines have about 10 times the pressure of a vacuum system. So you're going to get a more intimate fit in approximately into, into uh, between the teeth, so it's going to stay up better. And since pressure is even throughout, it allows for a much more uniform thickness of the material you know, on, for the athlete. This is a typical, typical uh, machine, a pressure laminate machine. It's great to see that Aspatar, their dental clinic, has the, the top of the line when it comes to the machine. So they're able to, to make pressure laminated mouth guards for all the athletes they come in contact with. What happens is basically this, this piston comes down, so the heating element is, is up high at the very top where you see the pressure gauge. Once that material sags down, just like in the vacuum form, that, that material is brought down and basically what happens is a piston comes down and applies equal pressure throughout the, map, throughout the EVA material, so you get ideal adaptation. This is uh, another one in the U.S. This is a mini star. This is actually a vacuum formed one, but they also have a pressure laminated one called the Biostar uh, that they sell. And this is the other one, the Urcopress, the TP and TPCI that basically are, as, has, are great pressure laminating machines. And they can turn it out very, very fast, very, very rapidly as you're at applying layers. These are typically the EVA materials. They're very oftentimes round versus a square, but you can use a square one. This slide depicts the basic difference between using four millimeters of an EVA in a vacuum form custom mouth guard technique versus a heat pressure laminated technique. On the left is a cross section of what happens when the vacuum machine it pulls the four millimeter sheet down. And as I had said previously, the material is thin over the edges of the anterior teeth as well as on the occlusal surfaces of the posterior teeth. On the right side, you'll see what happens when you have two EVA, sh EVA sheets that are pushed onto the same model. The first sheet is intimately adapted to the model with uniform pressure. By adding the second layer the pre uh, the, that's pressure laminated onto the first, you increase the thickness over the vulnerable areas, but basically it's applied uniformly. So you have basically a much more intimate fit 
and, all, and a more uniformity in the thickness of the, of the material being used. So one study found that when it comes to boxing and pressure laminated you know, mouth guards, one study found that 96% of boxers and MMA fighters only wear an upper mouth guard. The heavy pro in the States has two to three layers, six to seven millimeter thickness, and is constru and constructed of basically four millimeter plus three millimeter blanks or similar combinations. Having a lower model is important to balance the, the occlusion, at the very least, if you wanted to articulate it. Or you can, at the very least, you can heat up if you're going to do a functional, uh, functional balancing occlusion with, with the athlete and have them basically heat the material up when you deliver the mouth guard and basically have the, the athlete bite into centric and lateral excursions. The bimaxillary mouth guard, which is not used very often, but because we are in boxing, I wanted to at least bring it up, will join, basically takes an upper and lower pressure laminated and joins the two together. An airspace is created anteriorly so that they can breathe. It's very difficult to wear, uncomfortable, you know, as well, basically, and it's fairly expensive to construct. There's a lot of problems with it if the, if the articulation is wrong. Um, then you end up having, having a mouth guard that, that does not fit or puts your jaw into a, a bad position. So it should only be made by a dentist with an uh, experienced laboratory. This is a cross section of a heat presser laminated one, mouth guard in the incisal region. It, you can see where there's an intimate fit of the material and the layers are quite uniformly thick. So it really gives you ideal protection for the athlete, for the teeth, and, and ultimately is going to stay up and give you, give you what, your, what your athlete hopefully is looking for in a mouth guard. Here's a, another, another cross section of a, three layers, you know, you, to have an extremely thick mouth guard. Again, these three layers, there's no deviation in the laminating between the layers, and the fit is extremely close. It should be noted that due to the pressure used in the laminating process, that basically there's no special preparation, such as cutting holes into the model or trimming the edges as necessary to achieve really a perfect fit. The, um, so I'm going to touch base on the next generation of pressure laminated mouth guards. Hopefully all of you by now um, realize that there are significant differences. And really, if there is any opportunity for you and your, in, you know, when you treat your athletes, you know, I would highly encourage you to look at the pressure laminating technique for your athletes to give them the ma maximum protection. But there's also been some research coming out of Japan that talks about can a hard insert insert and a space actually improve the shock absorption ability of a mouth guard. The, uh, this was done basically by Tomo um, and was published in Journal Traumatology, uh, Dental Traumatology in 2006. There have been subsequent articles that have been published by Tomo and his, his group basically in 2011 and 2013 all in the journal Dental Traumatology. The EVA, what Tomo's thoughts were is that the EVA material blank that he used in the experiments was the Drufasoff. And the acrylic resin was Bilin by, by Drev. There were three types of mouth guard samples that were tested in his study. A conventional laminated mouth guard type of EVA material, which is what we I showed to you with the pressure laminated. And then a three-layer type with an acrylic resin inner layer or a hard insert. And the third basically was the same as the second, but a space was added that the basically did not come, so it had the material that did not come in contact with the anterior teeth. So there was a hard layer and then a space between. A pendulum type of impact testing machine was done and with both a steel ball and a baseball with strain gauges and accelerometers. 
and the analysis showed significant differences with the three types of mouth guards. The results with acceleration, there was a shock absorption reduction of about 40% with both conventional EVA as well as a hard insert. There was about a 50% reduction in the acceleration with a hard plus a space. But the key part is when you get to the distortion because the distortion is what happens when that material hits the tooth and ultimately can cause fracturing of the teeth or damage to the, to the soft tissue. For both buccal and lingual distortions, that decrease rate is larger than acceleration. The EVA showed approximately a 47% reduction uh, in distortion, whereas the hard insertion had 80% or more. And the hard plus the space actually appro had approximately a 98% reduction in distortion of the teeth um, and the soft tissues. So is there a best mouth guard? This, this slide kind of shows the differences uh, of, of what he used in the study. Basically, there was no mouth guard. B was basically a three millimeter EVA sheet, you know, laminated with another three millimeter EVA sheet. The C showed a hard insert in the middle of it. And then basically the final one had a one millimeter space in the anterior teeth that kind of wrapped onto the lingual to minimize that distortion. Basically, the hard and soft mouth guard showed more than a 90% shock absorption compared with only a 55 to 78% with an EVA mouth guard alone. Again, that's significantly you know, superior to any of the pieces of rubber that would be the boil and bites or any of those lower level type of mouth guards. Um, so, and again, the shock absorption with a thicker three millimeter hard and space mouth guard reached more than 95% of the highest impact power. So if you're going to have any, make, many, make anything for any of your mouth, any of your athletes that are ultimately have any chance of, of a blow to the face, whether it be a boxer or, you know, your football hockey player, anything like that, this if there's one mouth guard out there that can ultimately help those athletes or protect those athletes better, that would be it. Basically, the material that we use when we, we do it is a, what's called Ercoflex 95. It's manufactured by Ercodent, has a 95 shore hardness. We use that as our first layer um, because what we found is it has an intimate fit, a uh, more superior fit to lock into the interproximals and stays up in the mouth much, much better. It also has a little lining, a uh, polythene lining that basically you can heat in your laminating machine and you play, basically place that and that goes down onto the model. What it does do is anybody who's made any mouth guards, very often times you get all kinds of, of, of stone separating with the mouth guard and it, it's gritty and it breaks and everything. This is very much very clean in the process. So what we do basically is we take that 95 sheet, if you want to get a space, and that spacer, and we basically will cut that spacer out first. We'll, you, we'll basically pull that out with the mouth guard later. Okay, this shows where it goes on to the, to the, link, to the palatal area. And then what we use basically, we'll do another suck down of the Ercoflex 95 that will will suck down onto that spacer. Now again, that that liner which you kind of see here with this Essex Plus, basically that's a separator. So what happens is when you finally take that off the model, that that spacer and separator comes out clean. So you've created a space within your mouth guard itself. The hard plastic that we use is, is uh, 0.035, uh, again, Essex Plus, which would be the same as the Biolin um, mouth guard material that, that uh, Tomo used. So what it looks like, again, very similar to what we would see, what we would expect with a pressure laminated. Okay, and then our final layer, 
that we place over top of the hard insert would be a Drufa soft color. This is what it looks like underneath the slide on or the part of the mouth guard on the left is without the the spacer material we've pulled that out and the, the uh, slide on the right or the portion on the right basically has that spacer material in still in it. You can see the space around it. We have with pressure laminate again you have even lamination of the materials and basically this is this doesn't have the hard insert this is just the spacer material itself this this slide basically shows the hard insert and you can kind of see that with um, which is this this portion right here okay currently Tomo and, Do and Dorney and others are experimenting with both the thickness of the materials and the thickness of the space to determine if there's an ideal amount for each uh, to maximize for the level of protection for the athlete and for the sport. Uh, I'm, we're looking forward to seeing some of their results to see if we can get an ideal thickness of the hard insert as well as the spacer. And basically that's what it looks like as far as with the hard insert on there. This to me would be an ideal one for, for boxing because it really helps to minimize the blows to the teeth and when you're in a sport contact sport such as that basically it's a it's you want to minimize whatever you can as far as that that impact into the teeth sports guards and mouth guards are not all created equal it's our job to get that work that information out to our athletes to our coaches to our athletic trainers and to others in the dental profession you know, the only type that we can be counted on to give us the best protection for our children and our athletes are the pressure laminated mouth guards. Again, I, I'm past president for the Academy for Sports Dentistry. I'd encourage you, anybody who's very much involved in sports dentistry to contact the Academy of Sports Dentistry. It is a, you know, an international organization um, and basically offers some great opportunities for um, you know, learning more and more about sports dentistry and sports medicine. And again, uh, my contact information, if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to uh, speak to me or contact me later. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. I can't wait until the timer. And you had the pleasure of hearing from Ian Needleman earlier. And we've heard a lot about the problems, and now we're going to hear about some prevention and some solutions. Ian, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, great to see so many people back after lunch. Um, and it's uh, been a fantastic symposium so far. Again, sorry to disappoint you. But I'm going to move away almost exclusively from trauma to talk about oral health in sport. So questions I want to pose are these and try and answer some of them as far as we can at the moment. How might sport affect oral health? I showed you some data this morning that uh, elite athletes have poor oral health. Why? How can that be? Secondly, I'd like to ask in the opposite direction. How is it that oral health might affect sport performance? Um, I'd like to look briefly about some aspects of dental erosion and uh, sports nutrition, and then move into some ideas and suggestions about maintaining or improving the oral health of elite athletes. So, in terms of the causes of poor oral health, I think the first thing to point out is that what we believe is that the causes of poor oral health in elite athletes. Our working model is that it's quite a complexity. Um, the journalists, the media like to go for one simple story. 
disappointment, I'm afraid, again. I don't think it is a simple story, but I think all of us that are involved in uh, dentistry, oral health, sports medicine, know that life is more complex than that. So some of the aspects that we feel are important are these. Awareness and prioritization within sports medicine and athletes. Uh, nutrition, and I'm gonna come back and talk about each of these briefly in a little bit more detail. The access and availability of, uh, of, of care and uh, dehydration and dry mouth in athletes, and to some extent related to that, training-induced immune suppression. So briefly, I'm going to try and quickly go through, rather superficially, each of these areas. Awareness and prioritization. Well, we don't know very much about elite athletes or their, or their support teams, uh, oral health behaviors, and their oral health literacy. What do they know about oral health? the causes, the management of it. We don't really know. Um, we've got some data. Uh, what came out of the London 2012 study is that less than half of the athletes there had seen the dentist, had seen a dentist within 12 months of the Olympic Games. So this isn't just any old 12 months. This was the 12 months leading up to for what many of them would be the pinnacle of their uh, sporting career. And yet, over half of them hadn't seen a dentist. Interesting. What we know from a study in uh, New Zealand is that uh, on tri triathletes is that there was a low awareness of risk of oral disease. So awareness and prioritization you won't be surprised about is an issue. What about nutrition? Well, Daniel's going to talk a lot more about this uh, later on. So I'm just going to touch on one or two things about nutrition. And again, it's more complex than many people are trying to push it towards. So what kind of things are we interested in? Well, we're interested in, in relation to dental caries, tooth decay, clearly the type of, um, of, uh, of uh, nutrition, uh, type of carbohydrate, and the frequency of carbo carbohydrate intake. So those are some of the key things. In terms of dental erosion, we'll also be interested in the acidic intake characteristics. And I'll talk a little bit more about what do I mean by the characteristics uh, later on. For periodontal disease, could there be an impact of sports nutrition on periodontal disease, which is a chronic inflammatory disease? It's possible, because what we know from the literature is that there is a, or there can be, a pro-inflammatory effects of frequent carbohydrate intake. So that might exacerbate uh, the risk for development of periodontal disease, particularly in those individuals with a genetic susceptibility to it. In terms of nutrition and sport, well, um, clearly, carbohydrates at times are needed for performance in elite sport. And we know that there's widespread use of carbohydrate sport products, uh, not just in elite sport, but of course, widely in recreational sport. We know that there is an erosive potential of sports drinks, and that's been very well characterized. And of increasing interest, particularly in terms of uh, dental erosion um, in relation to sport, could be eating disorders. And we might suggest speculatively that this is more likely to be found in sports where body weight, composition, and aesthetics um, are going to be of more concern. What about access and availability of care? Well, we, as we were talking over uh, at lunchtime, um, is oral care funded as part of an athlete's general health care? And the answer is almost uh, always no, that oral health care is outside of general health care for elite athletes. There's another aspect which I guess many of us in the room start to get a little bit uncomfortable about discussing. Just because an athlete attends for a dental consultation does not necessarily predict better oral health. And there are, um, that's been shown really quite widely. So just because they, uh, an athlete or an individual goes to the dentist doesn't necessarily mean they have better oral health. And part of the explanation, and only part of it, is that 
the traditional dental checkup focuses on the treatment need at that period of time. And it does that more than, uh, more than prevention. So athletes may be exposed to treatment of particular issues, but they may not be exposed to prevention and health, and health promotion. And let's briefly look at uh, dehydration and dry mouth and immune suppression. So what do we know? Well, we know that saliva is incredibly important in protecting oral health. That's very well documented, and we can show extreme cases in individuals with xerostomia, with uh, very low um, salivary flow rates, with extreme examples of high caries rates, high dental decay rates, and periodontal gum disease. What we also know in terms of, uh, in terms of sport and athletes is that during physical activity, there are both quantitative, of course, but also qualitative changes during physical activity. And that may affect the protective role of saliva. So if we have a reduction in protection from saliva, that may enhance the effect of a karyogenic, a decay-causing, or an, uh, an erosive intake. So again, you start to see little pieces of this complexity coming together. What we also know from the literature is that um, during periods of intense physical activity, there will also be a reduction of protection, um, of temporary immune suppression, and this may again have an impact on increasing the risk of oral diseases. And we've had this journal mentioned already, this beautiful Aspatar journal, which um, I've been receiving for a couple of years now. I really enjoy reading it. Um, and there's an article at the moment, a very nice article indeed, about the acute effects of exercise on immunity. So if you haven't read it yet, please have a look at this. But it's quite interesting. One possible means to reduce infection risk is to use appropriate immune nutritional support. So that sounds potentially great until you then read that one of the recommended approaches is regular ingestion of 6 to 8% complex carbohydrate solutions. So the solution or a solution to reducing the infection risk may put the uh, athlete at greater risk of oral health problems. So again, the complexity, and we'll come back to that when we look at some of the strategies for improvement. Okay, let's look at it in the other direction. So how might oral health affect sports performance? Isn't that a crazy idea? Certainly, we've been told it's a crazy idea many times. And again, using the, these ring models, we believe it's a complexity of factors, and it varies from individual. It probably varies with a certain fingerprint for certain sports as well. So we may look at acute a pain and acute infection, effects on confidence, function, systemic inflammation, and socialization. And again, I'll just take you through some of these things. The pain acute infection is what most people tend to think about uh, with how can dentistry, how can oral health affect performance? So we're thinking now about the catastrophic high impact events. Some of those that we've seen and some of those before lunch. Uh, you very unkindly showed us those videos and we we're all wincing with some of those videos of those, those accidents that were happening, those incidents. They were really uh, pretty scary things. Now they're uh, highly catastrophic but they're also infrequent. What we're also postulating is that some of these other elements will also be very important, but they'll be important in a different way. Instead of this catastrophic high impact, here instead we have chronic episodic, probably low grade, well not probably, definitely low grade, and probably, certainly from the data I've shown you already, more prevalent to the extent of being possibly actually quite common. So again, looking at the catastrophic ones, Mo Farah airlifted to hospital after bathroom collapse. These kinds of things get into the media, very well known. Um, and it may be related to acute infection. These are some of the slides and some of the radiographs I showed you uh, earlier today, possibly related to dental caries decay due to gum disease or to infections around wisdom teeth, also called pericoronitis. And of course, trauma, which is um, the overall subject of, of the symposium today is yet another uh, very important example of that. 
But what about the, the chronic low-grade episodic? Well, as I made a case uh, earlier today, right at the beginning of why we have become uh, interested in performance and oral health, what we know very well is that there are psychosocial impacts of poor oral health. They, this has been demonstrated consistently across many research groups in different populations. The impact on quality of life, on confidence, on socialization, sleep quality. And perhaps those of us that um, are involved uh, in, in sport in whatever way will recognize just how important these elements can be in affecting an athlete's overall performance. And I come back to showing you some of the data from this morning from London 2012, the Olympic sample, 40% of them were bothered by their oral health. Uh, nearly 30% felt that there was an impact, a negative impact on their quality of life, and nearly 20% it was affecting their uh, or that was affecting their training and performance. Another route that we're looking at in terms of a chronic low-grade impact is from uh, systemic inflammation. So what we know from the literature, what we know from research uh, from um, uh, our sister research group at the Eastman, but uh, research groups around the world, particularly led from periodontology it happens, is that oral infection and inflammation induces systemic inflammation. And that's a consistent finding. It's very straightforward to measure. And it's been estimated uh, that if an individual has inflamed, ulcerated gingival surface area, which is a generalized situation. And remember, I showed you data this morning showing what a high proportion of, of individuals had most of their mouth affected. Then an the ulcer would be the equivalent size to the palm of your hand. So that's what some of our athletes are training and competing with. The issue is, of course, if it was on their hand, would be horrified. It's conveniently hidden away behind their lips and, in, and inside their, their mouths. So we don't see it. So there are reasons to believe, as, uh, which is not too difficult um, to accept, that we may have, in addition to the catastrophic e effects, we may have low-grade, um, uh, much more prevalent effects of poor oral health on performance. Let's move now briefly on to dental erosion and sports nutrition. It's a tricky topic, actually, to look at. Um, and from our systematic review that was published uh, this year, then up to about 85% of athletes present with some form of erosive tooth wear. And in one study, uh, or in certainly in more than one study, that compared to non-sporting controls, it seems to be more prevalent uh, in uh, elite athletes compared to recreational athletes. We know quite a lot about causation of dental erosion in non-athletes. And again, just to remind you, for those of you uh, for whom uh, you're not so familiar with oral health, dental erosion is not bacterial uh, in nature. It is mediated by low pH um, and the titratable acidity of, uh, of nutritional intakes, food and drinks. But it can also be affected by eating disorders um, or, um, or reflux. So in that non-athletes, where we are in our understanding is that there's no evidence of an association between sports drink use and dental erosion from this well-cited systematic review, which was actually quite well carried out. More recent data, interestingly, population data, have shown a positive association. So since this uh, systematic review was published, um, there are some data in some large population surveys which say, okay, that was the case up to um, 2012. Actually, there may be some uncertainty about that. There's also some um, more recent research which has just been published, which uh, you might be interested to take a look at, which suggests that the acquired enamel uh, pellicle, which is a protein layer which adsorbs onto the enamel um, very rapidly after it's been cleaned off, that the properties of that enamel pellicle may um, determine what the erosive experience of an individual is. 
So there's inconsistency in the literature um, in terms of the relationship between dental erosion and sports drinks. And what I'm going to suggest to you is that's not surprising at our level of understanding. Dental erosion is multifactorial. The research um, has looked at different types of individuals, and I think it could be difficult to generalize between one to another, those looking at athlete populations and general populations. The characterization of the erosive agent needs to be done much more carefully. It's not always characterized properly, and in addition to pH, we also need to measure titratable acidity. The pattern of use, if it is um, a sports drink, for instance, needs to be looked at because this does seem to be one of the determining factors. The frequency of use, whether it's sipped, uh, uh, drunk to a straw, uh, swilled around the mouth, and also the proximity when was toothbrushing carried out, how soon afterwards, which seems to make a, a, an impact as well. And as I said, what's, uh, there's very little evidence about at the moment is the contribution of the eating disorders. So what we know about dental erosion is it's prevalent, Nutrition is the most likely cause, including sports supplements. And uh, it's possible that those effects on saliva quality, uh, quantity and quality may also have an effect on the risk. And um, eating disorders uh, need to be looked at. So what about strategies then? Well, um, we were privileged to be involved with last year's IOC World Conference for Prevention of Injury and Illness. And what we did for that is to produce a, um, an evidence-based toolkit for elite athletes. So we took what is the best evidence for, uh, for prevention of the common oral diseases and tried to turn that into a format in a form that athletes might be able to use, um, particularly thinking about athlete drills, the kind of things athletes do almost without thinking before and after every training session. What we've also done to try and make things easier um, is um, what some people have called the gob uh, slang for a mouth in a bag. And the idea came to us for this from Team Sky. So Team Sky have this concept of bed in a bag where to enhance performance, to reduce sleeping, uh, 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 to improve sleep hygiene, they carry around a mattress in a bag which goes around, it's individualized to a particular cyclist, follows them around on tour all of the time. We felt that producing the evidence-based toolkit was fine, but unless you provided, unless we provided all of the constituents, I guess, uh, much like your emergency kit, then it's, uh, it's really asking too much of an athlete or their team. So we've put all, the, all of the kits together into one bag, and at the moment we're providing that to um, uh, the elite athletes, and, and um, we're evaluating their responses to that. What we've also done is we were commissioned by the Faculty of Sport and Exercise Medicine in the UK to write a position statement, and this is uh, open access, so uh, if you haven't seen it, you may find some of this uh, helpful or useful. And in terms of making it happen, some of the comments that have come out from that position statement are these. In terms of strategies to promote or to, um, to, uh, for oral health promotion, what we're arguing is that oral health promotion should be embedded within sport and exercise medicine. And I think some of the limitations so far is that we've been distinctly outside and not part of the core activity. And the key components of oral health promotion are these, identifying opportunities, where can it be promoted across different strata and stakeholders in sport? Because sport ha is, has very well characterized strata and stakeholders. We need to have a clear understanding of the determinants of oral health in order to uh, intervene. And um, a key part of our research at the moment is not only collecting oral health data, but also those determinants. Clearly, prevention of oral diseases must be a very important part. And the, the gob in a bag, the uh, oral health prevention toolkit is part of our, um, our, our attempt to do that. And also, what's going to be key, or what is key, is setting responsibilities. Who is, it, who is it that is responsible for delivering oral health promotion? What we're also making a strong case for is that all athletes should receive a comprehensive dental examination at least twice yearly on the basis that 
the or their levels of oral disease puts them at a high risk level. And that dental examination should be should lead to a personalized preventive plan as well as the provision of, of treatment. And we're also making a, a strong uh, uh, suggestion, and the IOC have also um, recognized this, that illness surveillance should include sufficient detail on oral health to enable us to tap into a huge amount of data that is already being collected. So we don't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel. We just have to join in and, and engage with others. Um, last year, we ran a conference in London on oral health and elite sport performance. And um, uh, as Karim mentioned, out, out of that came a consensus statement. And the consensus was fantastic because it brought together experts from not only oral health, but also from sports medicine and science and elite athletes themselves. Um, and uh, so that's, that's also uh, published in the BJSM this year, January edition. And that's open access, so you don't need a subscription to be able to access that. So our Centre for Oral Health, Oral Health and Performance, uh, which is based at UCL, uh, the Eastman, um, is encapsulating all of this activity, trying to bring all these different strands together. And in order to enhance this also, we've set up an oral health in sport network. And the network is important because what we're trying to do is to encourage to build an interdisciplinary community. It's really important if we're going to make progress that all of the people with interest in sport, the sport and exercise physicians and scientists, the nutritionists, uh, the physiotherapists, the dentists, everybody that's involved get together and have a conversation about how, what the issues are and particularly how to make uh, progress. Um, it's also a network for sharing news and developments and um, expertise. And it's also very important and very close to my heart uh, there to develop research collaborations because we need to collaborate together uh, to, move this, uh, to move this forward. So if you're interested, um, unfortunately, we've just had to, we're just in the process of migrating uh, servers at the moment. But if you keep an eye out for the... Um, the uh, Twitter handle, uh, Oral Health Sport, will keep you updated with how to get access to the network for oral health and sport performance. And uh, please sign up. So to finish off then, again, it's been just fantastic privilege to be here. And um, thank you very much for your attention this afternoon. Okay, so if you just stand, uh, this is a good chance for everyone to stand up. We're a physical activity uh, hospital, so if everyone can just stand up, it's good for you. Like, I'm not joking, please, thank you. It's. Uh, That's great, excellent. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. And do you need a hand or are you okay to do it yourself? Um, I'll have a go myself and see how we go. Um, could be interesting. I need to grab this wire first of all down here, I think. Oops. Actually, Japs, if you want to come down, maybe it could be helpful. Yeah, it's on this way, I think. Thank you very much. That's great. So, last. Uh, session is on the nutrition side and clearly very important it's been alluded to on several other talks some very hot topics here and Richard Allison Daniel Kings is very well um, qualified to talk about this so he's been a great recruit to Aspatar in the last couple of years and uh, I've had the pleasure of knowing him as a friend and uh, working seeing him come in from his very good fitness workouts um, he was trained in the UK with um, a food science degree and then a master's um, in dietetics. Two extra sports degrees, uh, the IOC diploma in, uh, in sports nutrition. Congratulations. And then great practical experience working with 
Great Britain teams, uh, the Olympics in 2012 and in Sochi in 2014. So working with elite athletes in Olympic sports and working with uh, Premiership football and delivering top performance from athletes. So uh, I didn't ask about your boxing experience, but uh, you can tell us about that. So let's welcome uh, Daniel. Uh. First of all, just to check you can hear me. Are we all okay? Yeah. Uh, welcome. Uh, thank you to Dr. Al Say for asking me to, to speak today. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed the, the presentations so far, and uh, it's been a real privilege to meet um, Professor Needleman as well, who really, from um, my perspective, from sports nutrition and oral health, has been a real sort of pioneer in the area that I'm going to go through. So I've been charged with the last 20 minutes slot of the last uh, day on boxing of the last working week, uh, last working day in Qatar. So it doesn't get any better than that, really. So um, uh, I've decided to come at this from a little bit of a different point. Um, and what I'd like to do for 20 minutes is share some experiences and observations of my time over the last 20 years working with what Professor Needleman described in his first session as high-risk athletes. Um, the first part of this that I'd like to concentrate on, if I can get this to work, is just considering the athlete itself, because ultimately what I'd like to try and do is understand why there is a problem from an athlete perspective, and then pick up on this area of performance that Dr. Needleman again sort of touched on in his last session. So who are we actually dealing with here? Well, we're actually dealing with a pretty special bunch of people um, who uh, like pain in a strange and sort of sick sort of way. Um, and it leads to some very, very interesting behaviors, uh, which practitioners make things exceptionally challenging to, to deal with. Um, if I can just introduce this lady to you, um, this lady is Kate Walsh who uh, is the Great Britain uh, female hockey captain, um, an exceptional leader of elite performance. Um, and I'm not going to ask you what you think happened next. Um, but this event happened in the last three minutes of the last game, uh, of, sorry, the first game um, in the Olympics for the GB team. Um, this resulted actually in one of uh, my most complex cases as a sports nutrition practitioner. So I am actually showing you some trauma in my talk. Um, the result of that uh, catastrophic collision was that, uh, and this is widely on the net, so this isn't confidential, um, Kate actually broke her jaw, uh, required her jaw to be wired, um, and promptly spoiled my holiday to France because uh, the day after this happened, I had a call from the coach saying, uh, Kate has uh, broken her jaw, she's going in for surgery tomorrow, and sh both she and I want her to play two days later um, in the next match. So really, when it comes to sports nutrition, it took my role as a practitioner to a whole new different level um, in supporting um, activity, supporting exercise, which is the role of sports nutritionist, a performance nutritionist. I'm not going to take thanks for this statement, but I thought I'd use it. This is, um, I'd give credit to this from the English Institute of Sport Performance Nutrition Department. Um, and ultimately, uh, for their performance nutrition, these are the outcomes that they're actually trying to get from delivering effective performance nutrition. But when you look at this statement, it actually kind of says quite a lot about some of the behaviors that we see about athletes. And when I sat back after London and reflected, and then I moved on to Sochi Olympics with the skeleton riders who are equally as nuts, they're the people who go down on a tray head first and a bobsleigh track, for those of you who don't know the sport. Um, it became quite obvious to me that um, we had to really understand these things to be able to put in effective interven interventions. And I've got kids, 
And the only way I could best kind of put this and other approaches that, that athletes would take to do with all health would essentially be this. For those of you who don't know the film, this is the film Madagascar. Uh, so you've got this little guy here saying, do you think we should tell them that the ship's about to run out of gas? And you've got this little guy here going, nah, we'll just smile and wave, boys. Smile and wave. Okay? Because everything that we have to take from athletes is literally that. It's self-reported. So if we know that athletes have got quite high pain thresholds, they're very driven by performance, and ultimately, especially during competition, we are led by what they want to tell us, it becomes hugely, hugely complex. I'll never for forget the day I had a chat with an England rugby back. Uh, for those of you who don't know rugby union very much, these are the sort of the pretty people who don't get involved in the big huddle competing for the ball. And I asked one of them, what do you think the similarities are between teeth and muscles? And actually, this is the response that he gave me. And it's not actually a bad response, because I think it summarizes where we are with athletes and teeth, in that they don't really seek help until something goes really wrong. In other words, they start getting some pain, or actually, um, it means they can't do what they want to do best, which is actually compete or perform. To be an elite athlete, we have to go back a few steps. Um, not everyone can jump straight from the ages of 10 to the Olympics. So what we have to do is we have to work our way back a little bit. And for me, performance comes in many factors, and measuring performance comes in many ways. But we have many athletes who start their elite pathway at the ages of 10 or 12 years. That has significant implications. Firstly, as athletes, they've already had seven or eight years that they know about being influenced by their parents, their families, as to what is normal, and other athletes around them. So if they start an elite pathway at the ages of 10 or 12, in some cases, in the cases of gymnastics, it means that we may only have four or five years to actually change their eating habits oral health practices and behaviors to actually make a difference. That's quite significant, especially because we know from some of the work done in oral health early in the 2006 that we know that poor oral health in athletes can affect all of these things. To become an elite athlete, you have to attend training sessions. You have to maximize your growth. You have to take on advice quickly in order to be able to apply it, learn it, and practice it. And ultimately, you have to avoid some of the pitfalls that Dr. Professor Needleman went through in some of his presentation to do with some, of the, um, uh, some, some sort of areas of nutrition. So let's dive into sports nutrition. And how can, apart from catastrophic events, how can sports nutrition really impact on some of the issues that we see in athletes in high-risk sports. I would basically mirror ex the exact comments that Professor Needleman just made. But from sports nutrition, I see us going across all of these areas. Today, I'm going to really focus on these bits. But in some of my slides, I will be touching on, as I already have done with the Madagascar clip, some things to do with reporting, physiological stress, and something to do with mouth guards and saliva flow. So what are the X factors? What could make the difference for sports nutrition and oral health? When, I, when I've been reading through the papers again and again over the last few months to do with oral health, I really like the way that the papers are split up to sport-related factors and non-sport-related factors. So what I'm going to try and do for the next few slides is work through on that basis. So to start with, I'd like to um, begin with the non-sport, the everyday diet of the athletes. When it comes to diet, there are some pretty huge assumptions that are made about the diet of an athlete. Okay? 
Um, I don't know if you are aware in the audience, but I just thought I'd summarize some of the literature that's around at the moment on eating patterns and habits. Because ultimately, if we're going to put in proper interventions, we have to know a lot about our athletes. And unfortunately, the literature is significantly lagging behind in reporting these to make us aware to apply appropriate interventions. Here's an example. An excellent paper by Louise Burke, 2003, back in the days when England were a good rugby team. Sorry, Welsh, had to bring that in, okay? Um, let's have a look at some of the papers, you know, the, some of the frequency of some of the papers that have been produced. In combat sports, we are here obviously for boxing today, but in combat sports, there's nothing about boxing that's been published. A lot of the work that's been published has been to be done with wrestling, for example, okay? There's been significant work done in Dr. Scott's area in American college football. Um, some of the work done in endurance. Um, there's been a little bit of work done in some of my past sports, like rugby union and rugby uh, league. But in terms of elite athletes, there's very little. In fact, there's been done more on coaches and referees than there's been done on elite athletes. And when recently in the sports nutrition department in sports science in Aspital, we've been trying to develop our own screening tool for sports nutrition. We've reviewed all of the studies that have come out to do with anything to do with eating patterns, and we've really only found seven key studies, which is kind of surprising. Of real significant note is there's no longitudinal or Olympic cycle work being done on the changing eating habits of athletes. When you think about those words, that's actually pretty heavy stuff, <laughs> okay? So what has been done? So this is one paper in 2013 by some colleagues. Um, again, a very good paper. I'm not going, to, it's the last session of the day, so I'm not going to kill you with tables and everything. There's a few points on here though that I'd like to, to um, raise and confirm. Carbohydrate is important for physical exercise. The good thing about this paper is it started to quantify exactly how much approximately um, carbohydrate athletes were taking for male athletes. They also did the same for fem female athletes. Um, and also, when you eat like an athlete, you have to eat regularly to not only fuel, but more importantly, maintain the muscle mass that you've worked so hard to actually try and keep. So for us, it was quite interesting and it's useful data to actually look at things like how many athletes reduce the amount of snacks on rest day compared to training days and what sort of types um, of carbohydrates they're having in these snacks as well. So it starts to give us some basis on which we can prioritize and direct our interventions related to sports nutrition and oral health. Here's a really big problem, okay? Um, we are not where we were years and years ago with food. The food industry is changing. These are, for example, sugar cubes that represent how much sugar is in each one of these dishes, okay? So this is just food that you and I eat. I try and be an athlete, but I'm not. Um, you know, whether you're eating these things and you don't know it, there are hidden sugars in here. We know sugars have an effect on um, dental caries. Um, we'll talk about dental erosion in a, sec in a second. But the, the landscape is really, really changing in our food industry. But also what's changing is the media coverage to do with sports nutrition as well, which sends really clear and complex messages to our athletes, both old and young. For example, 6,000 calories. What it doesn't go in to say, this is the Rugby World Cup at the moment, what it doesn't go in to say is that these are 120 to 155 kilo athletes who in a peak physical preparation periods, like when the Welsh Rugby Union were in Aspetar, for example, um, when they're training three or four times a day, that's fair enough. But what sort of messages are these sending? What sort of messages are these sending to other sports? Um, there's actually been quite a lot of analysis done on football players, elite football players in the Premier League. And what, they actually sh what the data actually showed was, although they had training sessions, because they were sat on their backsides when they went home quite a lot, 
all they were doing was playing Xbox, actually they led, they led quite sedentary lifestyles. So you're filling them with full of sugar and, su and calories when the, re the reality is they only need a small amount more at a certain time of the day as opposed to other people who are more occupational athletes. We've started to use some really huge and powerful words in the last five years in nutrition, recovery, fueling, that give this impression that you have to do something after every training session that you give, which is a real issue. As a colleague of mine said to me the other day after watching me eat in the Mosaico restaurant, uh, and he knows I swim at lunchtime, and he said, Dan, he said, uh, fair play, he said, uh, you're doing well to eat yourself out of a good training session there. Okay, because it's very easy to do. It's very easy to do. To pick up on this media point again, what effect is it having on the kids who link these messages from sport um, into their own habits? In Qatar, a few colleagues, a few students of ours uh, um, a couple of years ago now, this is unpublished work, but started to look at this a little bit in the context of energy drinks. And what they did, uh, they looked at 72 junior elite athletes in the academy, and they, they tracked basically the amount of energy drinks like Red Bull or Monster Drink they would have every week. Um, and they found that the they're the elite athletes, there was a significant difference in the energy drink consumption compared to age-matched student controls from Qatar University and local schools. Only 3% were aware, were aware of, of them what the uh, drinks actually contained. But unlike this study, sport wasn't actually the biggest factor that was leading them to, to take those drinks. They actually just liked the taste, which is interesting. So let's move on now to the sport-related factors. Um, I really like this word. It's a word which is used in the military a lot. Um, to summarize what this word means, if you've not, never heard of this word before, it basically means a load or a cost. And essentially, for me, that's how I see nutrition on all health. Athletes have to eat to perform. We all have to eat to live. So we all have a burden going through here <laughs> to make us survive. But athletes have more than most because they eat more than most. That causes an issue potentially with saliva release at certain times. For example, saliva release for snacks as opposed to main meals. Is saliva release sufficient to deal with the food in the oral cavity to clear it and have obviously put the positive effects we want to ensure good oral health? Um, you've then got the aspect in the previous two talks uh, with regards to gum shields. We have athletes using high carbohydrate drinks who are then shoving gum shields in their mouth, going for prolonged periods of play, significantly dehydrated, um, having their teeth exposed to high sugar solutions in a real stressful sort of environment for them. That's not fantastic. We've also got regulation changes as well, which we also need to consider. And I'll throw two at you here. You have the rugby one, where, or the football one, where there's not much ability to have fluids on the pitch unless there's an injury. So you have a potential stressor from that point. The second point then is in terms of hockey, where you can substitute as much as you want, and therefore you can drink as take as many gels as you want. So there's an education issue there as well. Let's look at some sport and nutrition specifics. Professor Needleman talked about sugars and, and acids. We've now got the added problem of zero drinks where sugar's been taken out. So we've got athletes taking a lot more um, uh, zero calorie drinks now, but they're forgetting about the acidic load on their, on their teeth of these things. We've got the multi-event competition demands where people's dietary habits change because they've got to recover um, for the next dietary, uh, the next competition, the next event. Professor Needleman touched on the making weight aspect to do with perhaps dehydration, but also what about the effects of sweating and calcium loss and magnesium loss that's important for oral health, for example. 
We know to do with bones, if there's insufficient calcium, there's going to be bone reabsorption. So if there's bone reabsorption, then they, potentially there could be some issue to do with the teeth as well. Something which I haven't really seen raised much today, but that's the cultural aspect as well, where you have actually um, um, uh, controlled periods of dehydration and the effect that that can actually have when, when athletes undergo it and, um, undertaking uh, periods such as Ramadan can have on their oral health. And finally, the effect of being inside and outside of competition and the different types of foods compared to normal that the athletes would actually take. Just to quickly go through some of these things a minute um, before I finish, okay, I just wanted to make you aware of some of the supplements that were on the market at the moment, which can have a stress to the oral cavity. Um, the use of, uh, uh, of beetroot juice now, three, te three teaspoons of sugar per dose, and we're recommending that that's taken five days a week prior to practice. And there is evidence being pushed out now to avoid mouthwashes at the same time as taking um, beetroot juice. So that's a complication. We have mouth rinsing going on because that actually improves cognitive performance as well as a physical uh, sense of um, not feeling tired. So we have that. So you've got a greater exposure of sugar to the greater parts of the oral cavity. And we also have things like cherry juice concentrates, which suggest there's no sugars in, but there are. There's 20 grams of sugar. And we're taking those at key times, for example, before sleep and after exercise where there's key challenges. And this is only going to get worse, I'm afraid, because we know there are companies now, sports nutrition companies, who have been doing work on genetics to come up as a marketing ploy um, to look at specific sport drinks for different body types and carbohydrate absorption. So the demand for sports drinks, I'm afraid, is only really going to get worse, and the problem is going to get worse. If I was asked to put my hand on my heart, these would be, this is the biggest summary of the nutrition burden. I personally think that it's more um, non-sport related. We have to make sure that they're making good carbohydrate choices away from sugars. I think the timing of the in interventions is important. And I also think educating my colleagues is very important to improve their um, awareness as well. Because oral health, is not high in our mindset for sports nutrition as sports nutrition practitioners. Solutions, I would suggest these things to reduce the burden. We've been through some of these already, but two things I'd like to stress first of all. One, I think we have to have some strategies that are linked to important parts of the training cycles. So when we increase our training volumes, we increase our nutrition. Um, we also increase our oral health. And second of all, working closely with food companies to um, reduce the acidity of certain um, sports nutrition products. Thank you very much. Sorry, mate. I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Scott Kologi to come to this microphone, and I think we're good to go. Um, <coughs> well, I think it's been an exciting day, and uh, as we started out the morning talking about the uh, overall more um, global sort of sports issues that come up, particularly the talk by Daniel just now uh, applies to all athletics. Uh, and uh, um, it's interesting when we talk to um, – Amir Khan the other morning, he was interested uh, in what he could do to best prepare himself to help prevent injuries and was concerned about metabolic health and those kinds of things and, and talked about the kinds of food or drink that he would intake as something that he felt was significant to allow to, to keep uh, to perform at that highest level. So certainly the elite athletes are becoming more and more aware of uh, uh, the principles that we've that we've heard about, and um, I think it'll make uh, make us all better. The more we, as sports medicine physicians and oral health physicians uh, and practitioners, learn about it and be able to offer uh, great advice. So, um, certainly, this has been an outstanding course. I appreciate everyone's attention here, and 
coming here and being so orderly and uh, staying on time. The speakers did a wonderful job, and this is just a, a great course. And our final closing remarks will be from uh, our course coordinator. Um, Good afternoon. I would I will not talk uh, a lot. I know all of you are tired, and especially today is uh, Thursday before the weekend. Just I would like uh, to thank uh, all of you for uh, your uh, attendance, and uh, special thank uh, for uh, our uh, speakers uh, who has done uh, really a uh, uh, very incredible uh, job uh, to deliver uh, this uh, rich uh, symposium. Uh, as you know, we are always uh, keen. Uh, uh, to organize uh, um, uh, such uh, this uh, um, leading uh, um, events uh, here in uh, Aspetar. And uh, of course, uh, our uh, aim always uh, to improve uh, our uh, uh, athletes in their oral uh, health uh, awareness. And uh, of course, uh, to assist uh, our uh, colleagues from uh, the clubs and uh, federations uh, in uh, preventions uh, of uh, oral inji injury, and that uh, also can affect their uh, sports performance. Uh, thank you very much.